Hi, everyone. Welcome to the School-Based Health Alliance's annual conference, Achieving Health Equity Through School-Based Health Care. I am Andrea Shore. I'm our Chief Program Officer with the School-Based Health Alliance, and I'm thrilled and honored to have you with us for the next four days. It's my pleasure to serve as your MC throughout our event. So you'll see me pop off and on and hear from me during plenary sessions. I wanted to share with you a look at our map of attendees today. Welcome to so many people from across the country. Shout outs to some of our states with top numbers of people joining us, California and New York, Ohio, Arkansas and Oregon are all joining us today. I really want to start out by thanking all of you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you do. The school-based healthcare field continues to thrive and grow, and we can probably all agree that these past few years have thrown us some challenges. Your commitment to our children and families is tireless and incredible, and we see you. A few stories to share from the field. We heard from a school-based health center sponsor organization in Connecticut where a mental health provider quickly pivoted during COVID and switched their art therapy group to virtual and mailed all the students their art supplies with seamless process and holding their group sessions via Zoom. We also heard from a school-based health center sponsor organization in rural Maine. As soon as there was a green light for, for vaccinating children 12 and older, they moved quickly to action. They got permission slips signed, arranged bus transportation, all within five days, hands, all hands on deck. They worked with five different schools, holding clinics in three different buildings, and, um, and brought children with these bus transportations to the vaccine clinics. So there's lots of stories like this that we've heard from the field in this past year. The program we have for you this week is very exciting and inspiring. Now it's my pleasure to share a message with you from our colleague, Maureen Hinman. She's the executive director with the Oregon School-Based Health Alliance. She's introducing our first plenary speaker. When our first speaker concludes, our CEO, Robert Boyd, will join us. Robert has been with the School-Based Health Alliance for three years. Most of his work for the last 20 years has supported public education. He has extensive experience with youth as administrative families, hospital chaplain, and a coach for multiple sports teams. A former congressional chief of staff, he co-authored the 2018 Stop School Violence Act while leading the Secure Schools Alliance. And in previous roles, he helped pass legislation in four states. So thank you to all of our speakers for today's plenary, and thank you to all of you for joining this week. Please enjoy. Hello out there to all my school-based health center colleagues and partners. I'm Maureen Hinman, the executive director of the Oregon School-Based Health Alliance, and I am honored to be able to introduce our next guest speaker and to recognize him for the work he has done to advance healthcare nationally, and in particular for his current focus on protecting the mental health of youth. Senator Ron Wyden, my senator from Oregon, has a history of social justice advocacy. He was the first Senate candidate to publicly support same-sex marriage, is an avid supporter of women's rights, has stood up for DACA recipients, and promotes affordable health care access for all. In his current role as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, which is responsible for Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program, among others, he has created a focus on youth mental health leading a bipartisan effort to address policy challenges that create barriers for youth to receive the mental health care that we all know is desperately needed statewide. He recognizes the connection between health and learning and the value of school-based health centers to our nation's young people and has made that concrete by supporting our efforts to secure federal funding for school-based health centers. It's a great feeling to be able to attend a meeting with my senator mention school-based health centers and immediately get an informed, positive, and supportive response. For all of these reasons, Senator Wyden, I am honored to present the Congressional School-Based Healthcare Champion Award in recognition of your steadfast leadership for school-based health centers and your prioritization of youth mental health issues on the Senate Finance Committee. 
Please welcome Senator Ron Wyden. Hello. Can you all hear me now? All right. Yes, you're all set, Senator Wyden. Go right ahead. Wonderful. And Maureen, thank you so much for that unquestionably inflationary introduction. It's early Monday morning, and uh, and you're already giving us a chance to talk about just the most important topic imaginable. And I'm thrilled to have this recognition from the School-Based uh, Health Alliance. And I'm just going to talk for a few minutes, and I know we've got a, a few questions. And again, I'm, I'm so pleased to be the recipient of this wonderful award there. Lots of others who deserve it more, and uh, and I so appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness. So let's kind of cut to the bottom line here. We knew that mental health was a huge challenge before the pandemic. Now it has increased many, many fold. And we in our hearings have heard from young people in rural Oregon who said that more than 80% of the instances where providers or, and, and teachers at uh, high schools recognize that there's a mental health challenge and they try to refer it to someone who can assist uh, the young person, there's just nobody there, literally nobody home. So we've got an enormous amount of work to do and that's what we're focused on on the Senate uh, Finance Committee. We've held hearings on the youth mental health crisis, as I said, hearing from young people who said that they couldn't get a referral uh, from their high school to providers who could uh, help. And we've spent many months putting uh, pen to paper on solutions. And the reality is young people and practitioners are of like mind on the key issue. And that is making sure you can access care where young people are in the schools and in other places where young people uh, congregate. Now, last week, the Senate took an important step with the bipartisan gun safety legislation, meaningful uh, steps to get kids the care they need and make families safer. The bill passed the House and will be sent to the president's desk. And most of the mental health work in this bill comes from Medicaid, which the Senate Finance Committee, as Maureen touched on, has jurisdiction over. And in particular, Medicaid was really the hub for the important work that the Congress did to expand mental health care for young people. It started with schools and ensuring that there would be uh, school-based mental health, assisting the states through Medicaid to implement uh, school-based uh, health programs under Medicaid. Then there was community-based behavioral health, also under uh, Medicaid, building on the terrific work done by Senator Stabenow and Senator Blunt, also expanding Medicaid uh, programs. Now there are model demonstration projects to assist with community-based mental health, that was the second major part of our legislation. And the third part really looked to the gold standard in children's uh, health coverage, Medicaid's Early and Periodic Screening Diagnostic and Treatment Program, EPSDT. Uh, and we looked uh, as part of our legislation to strengthen children's access with this program to comprehensive mental health services under Medicaid. So three major um, areas. And then finally, something I felt really strongly uh, about was we also uh, focused on expanding um, telehealth and there are provisions that reference that. And I would very much like to see this country come up with a mental health bill of rights secured through telemedicine. So thank you for this uh, honor. These policies are gonna make a big difference in helping young people. And I just wanna close with something I think Maureen may, may know. My, my brother I was schizophrenic and in the Wyden household, 
for years on end, we went to bed at night worried that he would hurt himself or someone else. In fact, my father put such an effort into improving my brother's health. He actually wrote a book called Conquering Schizophrenia. And before he passed, my dad acknowledged it was an awful lot to do. I think all of you would agree. But with Maureen and the wonderful people uh, leading in our part of the world, I'm sitting in my uh, dining room in Portland, Oregon, in southeast Portland now. Let's just make a pact here among all of us, from sea to shining sea, that we are all in in this effort to expand mental health services. What was in the gun safety bill is uh, an important uh, start. Senator Mike Crapo, uh, the ranking Republican on the Finance Committee, he and I are getting ready to put out our next uh, installment in terms of uh, our bipartisan uh, efforts, and we want to get that passed uh, this year. The first, in fact, was the telehealth, mental health bill of rights. So I think uh, Mr. Boyd uh, may want to start with some questions, and I'm happy to have that. And uh, Again, I'm so appreciative of uh, the chance to work with Maureen and uh, and all of you that are part of this wonderful organization. Mr. Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for your continued support and your heartfelt comments. Senator, watching today are hundreds of school-based health and education professionals from across the nation. Our first question is, what can we do to help you and your great staff advance the issues of student health? What do you need great, from us? Great, great, um, great question, Mr. Boyd. Centers around where you believe political change really starts. Some people think it may be in a government building, you know, somewhere in Washington, D.C. or your state capitol. That is uh, certainly a possibility. I believe that political change doesn't start in Washington, D.C. and trickle down. It's almost always just the opposite. In fact, it comes from the grassroots and moves up. Mm -hmm. And as members of Congress go home and they hear from the branches of your great organization, Maureen, obviously, our head here in, in Oregon, when they hear from folks at home, whether it's uh, senators or House members, they hear from parents, uh, increasingly young people, particularly in high schools, have created these advisory councils. I mentioned uh, uh, the young man who uh, testified from Lapine, Oregon, that they couldn't get any referrals. He's going to Johns Hopkins next year. What a wonderful, talented young man. So whether it's kids, whether it's parents, whether it's teachers, I would really, Robert, I would encourage all your members right now, because uh, senators, by the way, are home. This is the July uh, fourth break. I'm having town meetings, that sort of thing. Get out and uh, be all over the community stressing to your uh, legislators how important this work is. The gun safety bill is a start, but there's a lot more to do. Thank you, Senator. The, the, the other big question on the minds of many health and education professionals requires you to look a little bit inside your crystal ball. Mr. Chairman, do you think we're going to see an FY23 budget passed in this Congress either before the midterms or in a lame duck session before the end of the year, or are we going to live in the world of continuing resolutions? Robert, I, I always say I'm a little bit like Yogi Berra, who famously <laughs> said, I don't do predictions, especially about the future. And what Senator Crapo and I have said is that we're committed to getting the most reform possible in this Congress. So we're going to look at every vehicle. It's why when the sponsors of the uh, uh, gun safety legislation, particularly Senator Murphy and Senator Sinema, said, look, we want to have mental health reform accompany uh, gun safety measures. We said to ourselves, we've been doing the hard work already. We've got the provisions ready to go. The provisions that I described uh, to you, uh, the school-based mental health effort, community-based behavioral health, led by Senator Stabenow and, and Senator Blunt, uh, uh, EPSDT, the telemedicine. We had all that ready to go, Robert. All they had to do was basically come to us and said, not only do we have the outlines to describe this for members, we have 
black letter law. We have the actual text for how to do it. So we're going to continue that. And I don't think anybody can really crystal ball whether there's going to be a fiscal year 2023 budget or a continuing resolution. But what I will tell your members as we gather for this discussion virtually, Senator Crapo and I have said we're going to go after every single moving vehicle. There is nothing off the table when it comes to finding practical ways to assist mental health. The situation is that serious, and I don't have to tell all your members that. You all are living it uh, every day. You don't need a senator to drop, drop by and uh, give you some kind of message that uh, it is really uh, serious business out there. You all know it. You see it every day. And when people say, well, can we afford it? I say, we can't afford not to. Remember when the Surgeon General came to you know the Finance Committee and said, it takes years to go from essentially symptoms to actually getting treatment. We can't any wait any longer on that. We can't wait any longer to hold these insurance companies accountable. You know, these insurance companies, according to the Government Account Accounting Office, they're running what the GAO called ghost networks. Those aren't my words, that's theirs, where essentially there aren't any providers there and you can't get any services. And if you do get paid, you get virtually nothing. So you're having somebody of modest income eating the entire bill. So whether it is parity, whether it is services, we've just got a lot of heavy lifting to do. And I'm all in in terms of uh, working with you on it. This is probably a longer answer than you wanted, Mr. Boyd. But we're gonna no. we're gonna go after every single vehicle. No, we, Senator, we appreciate you and and know that that our field is behind you. Our, our staffs will be working closely with your staffs, and all you folks have to do is tell us what you need, and we'll push the buttons out there across the country to make sure that, that our folks get with their representatives and their senators across the nation. If, to, if to you all use bills. this break, Mr. Boyd, to get the message to your senators and House members about how serious this is, not only do we need to better fund those areas that, that I was talking about, but um, we know that we're just uh, hitting the beginning of services for rural America and for rural folks. They were so isolated, a lot of seniors, a lot of veterans. We just got a lot of heavy lifting to do. So I so appreciate everybody. Maureen, I don't see you on my screen now, but I assume you're out there in cyberspace. God bless those Oregonians because they're always bucking us up and uh, getting us good information. And uh, I guess, the chairman of the finance Com committee, I can't make any official motions or something, but you can see me raising my hand as if I was, and I just am um, moving that this important conversation be continued. And I don't see anybody on the screen objecting, so we're gonna continue it. Thanks, Robert and everybody. Thank you, sir. Be Bye safe. Now. God bless. God bless. Good afternoon. Am I up and running? Yes, you're all set, Robert. Okie doke. Good afternoon. Welcome to the, or good day, wherever you are. Welcome to the 2022 National School-Based Healthcare Conference. My name is Robert Boyd, as Andrea said, and I am the CEO of the School-Based Health Alliance. On behalf of our board and our fantastic staff, I want to thank you for all you do to bring health care to schools and for loving and serving America's K-12 students, particularly those from low-income communities. We know that all of you have plenty of options of where you could work and that most of those options currently pay a lot more than you currently earn. Nonetheless, you chose to serve schools primarily in low-income communities where healthcare services are needed the most. Thank you. As Andrea said, I joined SBHA in 2019 from the school safety field. If anyone had told me that we would spend 2020, 2021, and most of 2022 in a pandemic that would close our schools and stress our public health system to the point of believing uh, of breaking, I never would have believed them. Talk about going from the frying pan into the fire. If anyone had told me that our country would be even more politically polarized in 2022 than we were in 2019, I never would have believed them. 
If anyone had told me that we would be facing an extreme shortage of workers in all industries, especially in education and healthcare, I never would have believed them. If, 20, if in 2019 anybody had told me that gas would go to $5 a gallon, who the heck would have believed them? Honestly, though, after the 2016 election, if anyone had told me that any American could carry a concealed weapon or that Roe versus Wade would be overturned, I would have believed them. Yes, we live in a time of uncertainty and stress. We live in a country where the rights of women, people of color, and those who live in low-income communities, both rural and urban, are threatened and ignored. We live in the greatest nation in the world. With a leading energy producing country, yet energy, energy costs are skyrocketing, driving up the price of everything. We produce more food than anyone, yet we have hungry children and older people. Our federal funding priorities sometimes seem more focused on war and building buildings to keep out non-English speaking people of color. We are the creators of the internet and home to many of the best technology companies in the world, yet low income households both rural and urban, don't have access to the internet or the equipment to use it. There are assaults on freedom and democratic principles all over the world. And yes, as we saw last week and this morning, here at home as well. We live in a country with more guns than people. Now don't get me wrong, I hunt, just not with an AR-15. We've had more mass shootings than days in this calendar year and we've had 27 school shootings in 2022 alone. And most of these shootings were committed by angry young men. Today, gun violence is the leading cause of death among young people. And yes, it is a public health epidemic. Gun violence, pandemic stress, and school shootings have finally prompted Congress to agree that we have a mental health crisis among our young people. Ironically, school health professionals have been warning of this crisis for years and no one was listening, except maybe Senator Wyden. Thank God they are now. Now I'm not here to bring you down. I'm here to lift you up. I'm here to keep you focused on our core task of providing healthcare in schools and the critical importance that each of you play in that process every day. This is a crazy world in which we're living. We need all the help we can get. And I don't know about you, but I'm a praying man. I lift all of you up and give thanks for your selfless work to serve our children every day. Let's take a quick minute and assess where we are in the school-based health movement. First, the silos that used to exist between the health and education sectors have come down. We've seen the joint letters from the secretaries of HHS and the secretary of education. Our board now has key leadership from both the superintendents association and the Coalition of Community Schools. We work together. We are the fusion of, of education and healthcare. The competition for resources that plague the school-based health field are gone. We work closely with our friends at the associations representing the school nurses, school counselors, school psychologists, and school social workers, and all of them have representation, uh, have executive level representation on our board. We refer to our collective group as the school-based health services. You'll hear talk of that later on in the week. As America wakes up from the pandemic and finally acknowledges that our youth have a burgeoning crisis in, in mental health, in addition to our friends in the school-based health services, we've added our longtime partners, the National Center for School Mental Health, to our board as well. We even have two dentists on our board right now highlighting our commitment to bring oral services to Title I schools. Now, in previous times, there was always a question as to SBHA's preferred sponsor type for operating school-based health centers. Let me please be clear. SBHA is agnostic as to the sponsorship of school-based health centers. We support everyone that wants to bring health care, affordable and free healthcare services to schools. Do we recognize and publicly state that federally qualified health centers have the best chance of building sustainable operations in schools? Absolutely. Enhanced reimbursement for Medicaid services makes a profound difference in the long-term success of school-based health centers. 
But we also support the enhanced reimbursement for all those who provide health services in schools, including those employed by school districts. We no longer compete with the community health centers for school-based funding. For the last two years, we've worked together to lobby Congress for funding for new and expanded school-based services. In FY21, our combined efforts yielded 5 million for FQHCs to open in schools. This year, we received 30 million more for federally qualified health centers to open and expand in schools. But be clear, representing all community health centers, the National Association of Community Health Centers, or NAC, was the first national organization to sign on to our appropriations request for $50 million for FQHCs and $50 million for non-FQHC sponsors of school-based health. There is no daylight between SBHA and NAC on support for all types of school-based health centers. Both organizations put the kids first. And, at the, and to that end, we've added executive leadership from NAC and one of the largest FQHCs in the nation, Community Health Center, Inc. in Connecticut, to our board. Our chair, Dr. Carol Patton, whom you'll hear from in a few minutes, also serves at a Georgia-based FQHC. If you're not aware, last week, the House Appropriations Committee recommended $50 million more for federally qualified health centers and $50 million for other sponsors of school-based health centers to open and expand school-based health care. Now, as you'll see during the conference, we are enjoying a lot of bipartisan and bicameral support for our appropriations requests in Congress. You've already heard from Finance Committee Chair, Senator Ron Wyden. This week, you'll also hear from our other champions in the Senate, Senators Debbie Stapanow and Shelley Moore Capito from, uh, from Michigan and West Virginia, and the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee Chair, Senator Patty Murray from the great state of Washington. You'll also hear from our House champion, uh, Representative John Sarbanes of, of Maryland, you'll hear from him later, and Appropriations Chair Representative Rosa DeLauro from the great state of Connecticut will also speak with us. It's exciting to see so much bipartisan congressional support for our work. The administration is also supporting us. You'll hear later on this week from Secretary of Education Cardona as well. Now, I want to take a hot second and highlight some of the other plenary sessions you really don't want to miss. One is Dr. Uh, Nat Kendall Taylor, the CEO of the Frameworks Institute and an international expert on messaging. He will help us understand how we should respond to some of the attacks against school-based health services from extremist elements. That's a really critical session you're all going to want to attend. Additionally, Dr. Annie Reed, the executive director of Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente's Thriving Schools Program, will present the 10-year roadmap developed by the Na National Healthy Schools Collaborative, which is a group of national organizations in which we at SBHA have played a large role. Our Laura Bray will lead a discussion among our national partners based on school-based health services on this in the school-based health services based on the state of our workforce and our collective approach to increase the number of healthcare professionals serving in schools and the importance of diversifying that workforce. You'll also hear from Jim McCray, who leads the Bureau of Private Primary Healthcare at HRSA, and he's gonna talk about the federal government and particularly HHS's support for school-based healthcare and school-based health centers. Finally, we'll also hear from our friend, Dr. Pedro Noguera, Dean of USC's School of Education, and arguably one of the leading voices on education as a vehicle for achieving societal equity. Education Week consider, considers him one of the top three voices on education issues in our country. And he will talk about the critical role that healthcare plays in schools and the need for educators to embrace their role in the health of the whole child. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to be uplifted and challenged. I'm ready to learn. We have a lot to do to get school-based health services 
into and expanded for all, sir, all schools serving low-income communities. Remember, as the Senator said, we are stronger together and together we will prevail. Thanks for all you, you do and happy learning. Now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Carol Patton of Georgia, who is chair of the School-Based Health Alliance Board of Directors. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 National School-Based Health Conference, Achieving Health Equity in School-Based Healthcare. My name is Dr. Carol Patton, and I serve as the chairman of the board of directors for the School-Based Health Alliance, assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine and dental director for Whiteford Inc. here in Atlanta. All of you are here today are critical to our mission at the School-Based Alliance to provide critically needed services, medical, dental, behavioral health, and vision care directly in schools so that all of young people have equal opportunity to learn and grow. While the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted so much of what is broken in our healthcare and education systems, the approximately 3,000 school-based health centers across the country have so much to celebrate, particularly with respect to federal legislative and administrative actions. Nine months after this pandemic began, fiscal year 2021, Federal Appropriations Bill provided $5 million to the Health Resources and Services Administration to grant awards to 27 school-based health center sponsors that are federally qualified health centers, FQHCs. Three months ago, fiscal year 2022, the Federal Appropriations Bill increased that amount to $30 million, a six-fold increase. This has led to $25 million in grants to an additional 125 federally qualified health centers that sponsors school-based health centers. We continue to work with our congressional champions to provide parity for sponsor organizations that are not FQHCs, as well as to address critical issues like youth mental health. We look forward to the continued growth and success for our entire field. We are pleased and welcome and thank those champions in the House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate, and the Biden-Harris administration who have made this success possible. We look forward to continuing our work together as we strive to achieve health equity through school-based health care. This is going to be a great four days. Let's get after it. Thank you. Thank you so much for those remarks from Robert and Carol. I just have a few housekeeping items for you all as we wrap up our opening session. Um, a reminder that there are continuing education opportunities um, and those are made possible through the Community Health Center, Inc. and its Weitzman Institute, their research education and policy arm. There's an opportunity to earn a maximum of six CE hours for workshop sessions A through F. So please promptly evaluate each workshop session once it has concluded. You can sign up under the Weitzman CE survey icon in the Socio platform. And for more directions, please visit our How to Obtain CE. Our poster session will begin at 1.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, June 29th. And please join us then to view the posters and you get to vote for your favorite. And voting will close at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time that day on Thursday. We also invite you to participate in our event game. If you go to the event game icon on the Socio platform, you can join. You participate in the fun by applying game codes to collect the points. The winner will receive a $100 Amazon gift card. And this game will also close at 5 p.m. on Thursday, June 29th. We will announce the winner at the closing plenary on, oh, I'm sorry, in the June 30th plenary at noon. <laughs> Um, and a reminder to join us each morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the School-Based Health Center TA Tools and Resources session. Hopefully many of you joined us for our first session this morning. These are a great chance for you to learn directly from those who develop these fantastic tools and resources and ask them questions. I highly recommend these sessions. 
We're going to close out today's opening session by watching a video with voices from the school-based health center field. Thank you so much to all of you who contributed to this video. And then after the video, it's time for a short break. Go ahead and enjoy, take a stretch, and we'll see you back at our first workshop session at 1.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I invite you to please stay on for a few minutes and enjoy this video. My school-based healthcare center means a lot to me. Community care for our local community and surrounding community. My school-based clinic means to me being able to provide a place where children can come and get quality care that they need regardless of their ability to pay and helping them to feel safe and cared for each and every time. My school-based health center means that I can provide care to children while they're at school, which puts them in a better position to learn. My school-based health care center allows me to care for children who may not otherwise receive care. It's both rewarding and uplifting to know that we are helping children and families in their times of need. Hello, my name is Hannah Smith and I'm a school health analyst at the Oregon School-Based Health Alliance. To me, school-based health centers embody the concept of low barrier health care, literally meeting students where they are at school. To me, school-based health centers empower young people to prioritize their health and well-being while also providing their families with crucial services to make life easier. I wanted to send this video in to call out that Ohio's school-based dental centers are leaders in integration, innovation, and equity. When I meet with Ohio policymakers and talk about what is working well in Ohio, around oral health. I talk about the success of school-based health centers in meeting the oral and overall health needs of school-aged children. Just talking with them, understanding their story while they're here, that's what I loved. And I just love, you know, making sure they help them, making sure they feel better. And it warms their heart, so it, it warms mine to know that I can make them feel better. Yeah, it make a huge difference because I know now that I am safe and it can also help me with my health and I can always inform them if something's wrong with me so they can find out what it is and take care of me. Oh, la clínica significa mucho para mí. Estando la clínica aquí en este condado donde vivimos, se me ayuda mucho y me siento muy muy bien que mis hijos tengan donde ir a la clínica, donde llevarlos, donde acudir. Um, what difference does the school base make in my life personally? In my life, it made a huge difference as a high school student. I had so much going on. So utilizing the resources at the school base health center, such as um, sexual resources and mental resources was a big part of my life and gave me the knowledge that I know today. The difference it makes to me is not only do we prioritize our students' education, but also their health and wellness in and out of the classroom. Oh, the school-based health centers have been instrumental in our success over the last couple of years. Besides being a preventative measure that helps break down barriers for families to be able to access medical and behavioral health care, they've also been very proactive during COVID. They helped and assisted families in getting their COVID-19 vaccinations. They have put in some art therapy programs to support students who are struggling with some mental health issues. And they're always ready and willing to be very creative to be able to allow our students to access their services. Three words that I would think of when I'm thinking about school-based health center would be compassionate, friendly, and unique. Three words that come to my mind when I think about my school-based clinic are compassionate, safe, and inclusive. Are accepting, equitable, and upstream. I think I would go with the three C's. Uh, convenience, it's a great way for parents to not have to miss time from work um, and for students to get the care that they need right here at school. Continuation of care, it's, um, and collaboration, it's uh, we work together. Uh, the school-based health center uh, works in collaboration with the student's primary care doctor and the parents. So it's a win-win for everybody. <laughs>